We have with us John Previck and uh, Dr Ken Shuttleworth from Make Architects and from the Future Cities, uh, Future Spaces Foundation. And thank you for joining us uh, just now. We have a few questions uh, uh, to put to you uh, regarding uh, particularly the report, the recent report, The Future High Streets, which is available online and we'll, we'll give that link. Yep. Um, I want to start from a very broad perspective, if I might, and, and then narrow down to, to the detail of our cities and towns. But I want to start by perhaps looking at what you see as the biggest challenge to future-proofing our cities and towns. I think the biggest challenge has to be climate change. I mean, climate change is the most incredible thing that we need to tackle now. And if we don't tackle it now, we, you know, anything could happen. We have no idea what's, what the consequences are going to be. So I think that's uh, designing for that, uh, making sure we you know, anticipate climate change and try and reduce the amount of carbon our buildings and our cars and everybody's actually using is the biggest single threat, I think. And is the civilization. that incorporate greening of our cities or...? I think there's, you know, that's there's a whole... Um, it's not just about um, just greening the city, it's also about just reducing the amount of carbon we're actually using, reducing the amount of energy we're using in our buildings, reducing the amount of uh, emissions our, our, our buildings and our cars are actually, and aeroplanes are actually emitting. So it's a, it's a huge, huge um, topic that we need to actually tackle. And it's not just cities, it's every, the whole of the planet is actually, you know, it's really, really critical to get to grips with it. Um, there's lots of initiatives doing that, but that is the, the, the fundamental thing that we wake up every day thinking about when we're designing our buildings. How do we make them more energy efficient? How do we reduce the amount of carbon? You know, how do we um, make them actually work in a, a much more sustainable way? So, you know, for instance, water supply is really important as well. Can we get them to you know, use flushing um, from the rainwater rather than actually, you know, actually using potable water for going down the toilet? So those, all those sort of things are really important to us as architects. And, and I think the foundation, um, you know, that's almost a given. You know, we know that's a problem, and the foundation is looking at the first report at the, the high street itself in, in particular. And that really is where you start. You start your day thinking along those lines. It's not something that's really <coughs> a must somewhere along, along the project timescale. It, it really is at the outset. I think, you know, years ago, um, maybe, I don't know, 10 years, 10 or 15, 20 years ago, it was like a green wash you used to put over a project yes, at yeah. the end. <laughs> so, you know, you'd end, you'd end up sort of making it look green and put windmills on the roof and things. That's really changed. And, you know, we now, it's so embedded into the way we think that there's no longer a sustainability angle. It's just, you know, it is just part of the project. Um, and we really do think about trying to make the projects as lean and keen and as um, sustainable as absolutely possible. It's absolutely fundamental. It's not just the projects, but it's thinking about the environment as well, the infrastructure as well. Mm. So yes, we do. And John, any particular view on the future proofing? Well, apart from the green agenda, I think it's the other, the other most critical one for me is, is social integration and the maintenance of uh, a social cohesive society within, within London, within cities generally. Because the fear that I have, in a way, is that we're, 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 in a sense, bringing cities uh, up to a level where only certain people can afford to be there. And if that carries on, then we're going to basically be, busy, be build, building a wall around the city where only certain types of people are going to be allowed to come in. And those that do come in that aren't those people are simply servicing it and going back out again. And that's not a city I want to be a part of. And in your recent report, you've been talking about the importance of education and universities being very Indeed. much the centre of yeah. the town. Um, and very recently, the Lord Mayor of London has spoken about cities being factories of the mind. Yeah. And is that something that would really resonate? Yeah, ab absolutely. Intellectual capital is at the heart of any economic success that any city has. And I think university are the factories for this intellectual capital. And what cities want to do is keep that intellectual capital within their own confines in order for them to then breathe their economy into another level. And so, no matter where you go, I mean, obviously at this time there is a lot of uh, energy put into financing education, a lot of money going into uh, further education, particularly universities, from outside um, help. So people are funding it, people are sponsoring it, government is encouraging it. There's now students paying 9,000 a year to, to, to do it. There's a lot of money sloshing around. Now that money should then be used uh, post-university to give those students an opportunity to get jobs and those jobs are quite often self-generated. So if we can em employ, uh, let's say, these people in, in parts of the city where they can then start their own research projects, their, their own you know, businesses within uh, a cheaper incubator space, 
then we're going to keep the community going and the whole intellectual capital churning, keeping going round. It's also bringing the universities back into the town centres rather than allowing the university to have a sort of out-of-town campus we have to get to by bus. It's much better to bring them actually in, so any new buildings they want, they should be in the city centres or town centres on the high street, to actually encourage the students to be part, yeah. integrating more with towns. So we have the, the, the town centres as, as factories uh, of the mind, if you like, and um, then we have the streets bringing these people in from, from outside and facilitating that still further. Um, but, but the infrastructure that exists in our towns and cities around the UK, not just London, is, is that something that is, is sufficient uh, currently or is it, is, is it a complete regeneration that we need to be thinking about? Well, if you talk about densification, then clearly infrastructure has to follow. Um, you know, a pipe so big is not going to do, it might do for 10 people, but it might not do for 20. So if you're talking about that, that level of integration, then the whole system needs to be considered again. Hence the things that London are, do, are doing at the moment in terms of regenerating its, its infrastructure. So transportation, uh, sewage systems, electricity, gas, everything needs to be upgraded in order to maintain what we believe to be the answer, which is a high density, um, living for all city centre idea. Um, garden cities, for example, have been talked about recently as another interesting uh, kind of sidestep to get people into yes. homes quickly. We believe that's probably not the right place to go. Um, bringing people into cities rather than having them into in islands on the outside is, is probably a better solution. Because there's been a whole sort of movement over the last sort of 50 years to move people out of the centres with out of town retail, uh, the universities moving out, um, you know, out of town business parks, mm -hmm. you only get to by car. Um, you know, I think that's got to change. That should that's got to be reversed. You've got to get people back. Well, they haven't got to use their car. They can go on the bus. Uh, we use the tube in London, um, and you haven't. You know, you can actually do everything you need to do within your sort of walking distance of where you live and work, rather than this whole problem. You know, car journeys in and out of city centres. And th that's going to involve a lot of people, a lot of different disciplines, and maybe overused, but the term collaboration, the networks and collaborative networks, are they in place to deliver this sort of thing, or have we got an awful lot of work to 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 do to get there? to facilitate this sort of vision? I think as a, as a professional, if you're looking at it at a professional level, clearly the, the integration of a, a, a team that can deliver products in, in the community, be they buildings, be they roads, whatever, that system is there. I think the funding, the, the mechanics of actually getting it done, that still clearly needs a lot of, lot of work. Um, we're moving very much from uh, a society that's almost been brought up on things coming from the state into one that now has to come from the private sector. And as that change is happening, both at, in, at town hall level particularly, where you know, clearly a lot of uh, officers are now moving on to do things in the private sector, we're, we're actually uh, really closing off a lot of departments. Where is all that going to go? Who's going to be um, managing uh, all that structure? Who's going to be um, you know, taking the responsibility for how cities are going to work? It can't possibly be just the private sector. So we've got to be very careful how far we go down the road in reducing uh, um, council, town hall responsibility for things going on in cities. And we've spoken about in the centre again, going back to the idea of them being these factories of the mind and the need for education and the universities being based there. And of course, very often, and not exclusively, we're talking about young people. Yeah. Have we really engaged with um, Generation Y, to use that no. expression? Not at all, no. no. We need to do more. Yeah, Ab absolutely. We, we've, we uh, as architects, have been working with a number of people, and, and particularly one particular group called Open City, uh, to engage with the, the youth of London and actually ask them the question, what do you think your city should look like? What do you think your streets, your squares, your buildings should be doing for you? And my goodness, we've learned so much about what they think they want. And it's not necessarily what you, what you think. They're very clever very uh, upfront about what, what they think is the right answer and if, if, if you think more it's helped me as a designer to design better places because I, I now think back to those days of when I spoke to them and obviously we're still engaging now of course but those early days when, when they first informed me and it, it makes me say to developers for example you know you need to think within your very large development somewhere where people that for example you know, don't go to pubs yet because they're too, they're too young uh, that to, to do that and they're probably too old to sit in a community centre and, 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 and play with their mates 
they're sitting on the streets at the moment, on walls, you know, playing football on, on, in, in parks, whatever, and what else can we offer them? So that's an engagement that we think is very, very important, because these, these are the people that actually will you know, make all the decisions for us when I get old. And I'd rather give them a good chance than a good startup. <laughs> And the Future Spaces Foundation, is that um, engagement part of your remit? Do you, do you see that as part yes. of your engaging with universities? It's one of our recommendations, in fact, is to, is to, you know, is to engage with the youth on, for the future of the high streets. There's a panel, we have got people on that who are actually fantastically um, linked in with youth, um, youth bodies and um, you know, homeless people, things like, things like that, and people who actually look after um, you know, people are less fortunate than ourselves. We've got a real, the, the foundation has a fantastic range of people who have uh, different specialisations and that's, that, that will con continue on to the next report and, and the one after that and the one after that. So it's just the first, the start of it. Excellent. So we're at the start. We, at the start, um, we have the, the future High Street report available online yeah. for download yeah. and we'll provide that link on the screen immediately. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. And thank you very much, Ken. Thank you.